Um, this morning, um, I want the I feel I sense like the Lord wants to talk to us about <clears throat> um, anger and how that manifests in us, what happens in us, our part, and how to process and how to deal with that. Because I want you to know, to get angry in and of itself is not sinful. Look at the person next to you and go, oh, whew, I'm feeling better already. <laughs> yeah. Whew. Oh, okay. Now, we know that our anger can if we allow it, you know, um, bring forth our sin or the way we conduct ourselves, or the attitude within us. And I'm also feel like connected to this um, just kind of in the later portion of the message, marriaging together this anger and also the importance of forgiveness. Um, say this phrase with me, sunset forgiveness. Come on, you can do better. Sunset forgiveness. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, you can do better, but we'll just skip it for now. I just you know. The scripture, we'll come back to it later. It's Ephesians chapter 4. Don't let the sun go down on your anger or wrath, that anger that can, you know, if we don't challenge it by the Spirit of God in us, that anger will wreak havoc on uh, our relationships, our life, people, um, our testimony of the Lord. And it's also going to wreak havoc on us, the individual, your own person. And not just spiritually, um, certainly emotionally and mentally, but also, you know, they find out this affects your body, too. Um, hey, I want to I go be with Jesus. I want to be there with him in eternity, but I don't want to cut my days short here right? You know, he knows the days, the hours, the numbers, but I don't want to cut my time short here um, as much as some days it's like, take me now, you know, and uh, then there's other days it's like, oh, you know, yeah, this is really great, this is good, or boy, Lord, I'm getting to know you here going through these trials and testings, and Maybe I wouldn't get to know that of you if I cut my day short, right? I mean, I know we'll see him face to face and all his glory, but the virtues that we learn about the Lord and who he is by going through the muck of our life, man, you really get to see who he is. We, we get to see how he shows up in our life. And, you know, when we're going through the tough times, we don't often pause and think about that. We're just too busy trying to deal with it and deal with people and deal with ourselves, and, you know, deal with the toil of this life. And so um, I want to just, I believe the Lord just wants to mention a few things about from his word and some things about what happens in, in us physiologically um, and, you know, maybe why anger was was put there and how we function. You know, the scripture says we were wonderfully made, right? You know, simple, fragile, tough, just the complexities and the resilience and all of those things um, of how we have been made and function. And so <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about things. I'm not a doctor, as you know. But I want to mention a few things that happens in us, how we were made. And just because we were made that way, it doesn't give us an excuse 
to sin as if it's God's fault. So you have to remember that he's made things with a design, and because of sin, we operate outside the design, right? Yeah, outside his design because of our own desires and sin and different things that we feel or we think. And so um, God has given us, you know, the ability to be angry, but he's also given us a power that we don't have to sin in our anger. And we can't blame his design and say, why did you make me like this, right? We learned that from the potter and the potter's house. Another place in scripture, I don't want to go there. I'll just get off on a whole nother piece. Um, so anger, did you ever notice anger can, did you ever notice anger can rise pretty quickly? I mean, I'm sure you've seen that in other people. <laughs> Man, we can go to zero to a hundred like that, can't we? How does that happen? You know, but I want you to know that there's, there's this physical stuff inside our body and, you know, how our gray matter works, our brain functions. Now, as I mention a few of these things, to some it's going to sound like, man, pastor's really intelligent. So to you three people, that's great, okay? The rest of you are educated and probably many of you are in the medical field and, you know, to you, you might go, oh my goodness, he's slaughtering this. Well, just be gracious with me. Um, so there is this little thing in your brain called the amygdala. How are we doing so far? Sounds like a dinosaur, right? No, amygdala. There's this little thing in here, okay, that um, when we experience um, things in this life, it, it very quickly, okay, it responds. It's um, where... It releases, and well, it, it talks to the, ready for this? Here's another big word, the hypothalamus. It's up here. It's where we get this response where anger, it's where we experience emotion, okay? And we, we feel an emotion, and physiologically things happen in us. So things are, I want you to know, you might look at your children and think, is there anything going on in there? I want you to know there is stuff that's actually going on in here, Okay? It's the kind of thing that where you sometimes look at a person's response and say, my goodness, what's wrong with you? It's what's going on in here. Okay, so physiologically, this wonderful way we were made, um, you know, it gives fight, flight, or freeze. You guys are probably familiar with those kind of terms. It's this thing that goes on, and we either, like, we're ready to fight, we're ready to run, we just kind of lock up. We freeze, and we experience these things because of what's going on in here, okay, that causes us. For example, when anger comes, and we, we feel that, we see it, we pro it is zero to 100, right? Boom, it just releases this, and it starts to happen, and it's bang, it's game on. And, you know, one of the great things about anger is that, you know, it, if it's, there's a point where fight and flight and freeze, some of you think, oh, yeah, fight, that's the only good one. The other ones are no good. Hey, listen, all of those are used in protection of self or others. Freeze isn't just lock up and, oh, I don't know what to do. That can happen, you know. Um, and it's not just anger. It, it's other things. It can be excitement. People, you know, I, it's when I propose to my wife. Really? Oh, she's jumping around. And I'm starting, she's excitement in having this. I'm st fear is starting to set in. <laughs> because she didn't say yes yet. Okay? So, you know, we, these kind of things, it's not just anger, but we're talking about anger this morning. And, and that emotion that is so strong, like any of our emotions, so very strong. And so 
The amygdala here, where we experience emotions, it activates, all right, the hypothalamus, which in turn talks to, to the pituitary gland. There's a lot of conversation going on up here. And what happens is it releases and floods our, floods our body right away. I mean, it's like, that's how we go zero to 100, okay? It floods us with uh, uh, cortisol, the stress cortisol. It releases other hormones in us. It releases these neurotransmitters and all this stuff that's going on. So here we are, wonderfully made within God's design, all of that to be a help to us. Now, when sin enters humanity, we allow this in the design. We take it and use it for destruction outside of God's design. And this is the beauty of the redemption of God and the sending of the Spirit and the display of Jesus Christ who got angry and did not sin, that people could see it, we get to read about it, that there's a way to work within the design of even anger. And then there's our way of working outside the God's design that brings great harm to us and others. And so when this happens, before you know it, we're just filled with, you know, this, the, the neurotransmitters are going, the, 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 our blood pressure goes up, our heart rate increases. You know, you wonder sometimes somebody experienced something, got them excited, who already had some heart issues, and all of a sudden they have a heart attack, right? It's not everybody who just sits there at lunch. For some, it's that way. Of course, maybe they're really excited about their sandwich. I don't know. I mean, the sandwiches in my house are amazing, so I, I get it, you know. But, hey, we, we get angry about something. And you wonder why God's instruction to us is to have sunset forgiveness. So this stuff's going on. In us, well, these hormones and the neuro neurotransmitters they affect the prefrontal cortex, which is where we do a lot of our thinking. Now you see where this is going. When this happens, zero to one hundred, and all this is going boom like this, and it affects our thinking. Did you ever have words come out of your mouth because you were angry and you know in hindsight those were not the right words, right? Can you be honest? You're probably sitting by friends or people who know you. I can ask them on your behalf if you'd like. Testimony time. <laughs> Tell the story about your friend. You know, okay. So... Um, have you ever been around somebody who just, they, they blew up or whatever it was, and later when some of the dust settles, you may have conversation about it, and they say, I never said that. And you're like, uh, I'm sorry, what, what, uh, what planet are you living on now? It's like they don't remember it. Now, for some, it's an arrogance thing, so you don't want to expose your weakness. But they've discovered that where this thinking is, and when these, this, this anger happens, and we just, we just, you know, uh, where we say things or our conduct isn't right, you know, um, they've, they've done this in studies and observing and all of this that there's what happens is even our vision what we see gets limited it affects our thinking it affects our vision uh, the, the remembering of everything that just really happened our short term memory is kind of the focus and all other you know all the other thinking pieces kind of go away and um, 
we are, it, what happens is when this anger happens and all this is released and we're worked up and, you know, it, our brain is focused on new memories and, and it's amazing how some of the short-term memory gets lost after the fact. It's what I didn't say, it's what I didn't do or whatever. It is. And all of this is going on. And so this is the way we're made and now sin entered and it's like, well, gee, if I get angry, basically I'm a mess and I'm sinful. Well, I want you to know it's not left to that. You and I, through God's design, have a way to really be angry, not sin, and resolve it. Every one of us in this room have sinned in our anger. Every one of us. I, I know for all the people standing on the platform right now, they have. <laughs> sure. And I can't say, well, that's the way God made me, so that's just the way it's going to be. Because it's not. He's given us an ability. He's given us a power of His Spirit. He's given us His Word, His very, his very self. He displayed here on earth when God gets angry, when Jesus got angry. And not sin and the anger. But in the anger, it was used within God's design to protect, preserve, sound the alarm, get the attention so that everyone is kept and God's principles are kept and that he's honored. See, and the list goes on. So, physically they've discovered um, in brain scans. Um, I know some of you are like, when's he going to get to the scripture? Just hang on. Don't walk out and say, that hey, preacher, he didn't use this. Listen, just hang tight. And if you're paying attention, there's a lot of scripture I already used this morning. Anyhow. Um, brain scan, it shows that long-term anger or the regular practice of anger actually brings a damage to the prefrontal cortex. And so um, the amygdala gets larger and the prefrontal cortex begins to shrink. Now the beauty is they have discovered something. That the amygdala, do you see that? floating down right here? Sorry. You can't see it from back there, but I can. <laughs> it's funny, that just showed up when I was talking about brain damage, right? You guys are going, oh, okay. <laughs> I should have just ignored it. Yeah, whatever. Okay. So, so they've discovered, get this, they've discovered something. That we can actually, God has made it possible for us to actually grow and repair gray, gray matter in our prefrontal cortex and shrink the amygdala, okay? And the, how this happens, you ready? It's a biblical thing. Now, some people use it outside its design. This is what can happen. If you, you deal with anger, or if you're like, hey, I, I get angry, or I go zero, and I, or when I get angry, I sin, I don't get angry that often, but I, this is something that's going to help us. God's provided an answer, and the doctors have found out about it, you know, after all this time, that you can repair and grow your frontal cortex, because when, when we get angry and it affects our thinking, this, the, this is the ability to reason. This is when we are, you know, um, impulsive and reactionary and where we make very poor decisions. See what anger does to us? You've seen a person get angry, right? They are not making good decisions right now. Okay? I, I remember just a while back, I was 
away for a couple of days and golfing with a few friends. And I didn't see it, but they, they saw it. And it was a couple holes over. Some guy, you know, playing golf is over there ranting and raving, yelling, made a bad shot, took his driver, slammed it on the ground, and then stood there stunned as the head snapped off. Now, I don't want to tell you what golf equipment costs if it was brand new, but that could have been a four or $500 driver that his anger just got the best of him. It was a poor decision. What about you and I? You know, when you punch a hole in that wall, you actually have to repair it later. And everybody hates drywall work. <laughs> we, we just make poor decisions. We, we hurt people. We hurt ourselves. We, we get rash. And so here's the, this, is, this is what they've discovered that will grow the gray matter where we do our thinking and processing, okay, and reasonability, even in light of all the hormones that are released for us to take some action forward, backward, or freeze, okay? But God has given us the ability to process this and not live outside his design for how we've been created. And it's this, they've discovered that meditation will build gray matter and repair it back, the, da the damage that an accident has done or that anger has done. A meditation, it, it gets a bad rap because those who promote it do it outside of God's design. But I want you to know that meditation started with, with God's people. Back in Genesis, it's uh, chapter 24, and I think it's verse 63. It says that Isaac just arrived home and he went out into the field to meditate and then he saw a man approaching him. And he, It's not about the story, it's that he got home and this is what he went and did. He went and meditated. Now we know in the life of Isaac that his meditation had to do in the context of talking with God, thinking about God and who he is and his words to Isaac and Isaac being the son of promise, what God has done in the life of Isaac. You see, in those moments when we remember God and he is on our mind, no matter what is released in us, it now has another filter to go through, right? Right? It doesn't just get to function and control us. We have the opportunity to process, manage, and control it ourselves. Listen, if your child runs out into the street, you had better scream and start running for them. Right? That's what goes on. Your heart races and your, your muscles tense up and you, yeah. The building's on fire, you better get proactive. And you better make some noise, and you can act like a crazy person the way that you're screaming and how loud you are. Because it's appropriate to get everybody's attention to get them to safety. When we meditate, we will respond in that character and virtue of God because we have taken time to build this gray matter that it is not just submitted to the, the cortisol and the hormones and the, and the um, neurotransmitters. We are subject to Christ, his virtue, his character, and his design. You and I do not have to sin in our anger. Our anger can cause us to act wildly, but not sinfully, if we're protecting people. You see, it, it helps us this way. For example, what about the driver who just cuts you off? I don't know how you deal with it. Pound your steering wheel, wave at them. <laughs> <laughs> you 
yell things in your car, track them down, cause you to make a driving error, because you're just zero to a hundred inside. You're just, uh, let, me just, let me just ask you this. If you knew that they just got a call 10 seconds ago, they hung up, and they got an emergency call that their child is having an extreme grand mal seizure. Now how are you going to re react to being cut off by them? See, it's helping us rethink. You can still get worked up, but now you took a moment and you understand something. And it changes your response to anger. You see, you have the power to do it. By God's Spirit, by the truth of who He is, you and I have the power to do this. It's called reframing our thinking. Well, how do we reframe our thinking? We meditate upon God, we meditate upon His Word. Isaac went out and meditated. The scripture's full. I mean, here, I'll read you some. The scripture's full of these verses on meditation. Joshua, who is, you know, about to, the, the leadership is being transferred to him from Moses to Joshua. And this is one of the things that, that God tells Joshua because he knows that Joshua is going to get really angry with God's people. After all, Joshua saw how God's people conducted themselves through the wilderness and how they treated Moses. And now he's the guy. God, he tells him this. He says, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then I will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. See, see Joshua's human. He, he was made, you know, like you and I. And he could get angry. But God says to him, here, you meditate. You reflect, you think, and then take this and apply it into how you live. You have to reframe your thinking, Joshua, so that no emotion will take the best of you and cause you to sin. Because you have to understand something about sin. Your sin, my sin, it affects the whole community of believers. It's not just me. It affects the whole community of believers. We're a body. And so, meditate. It's going to build your gray matter, your prefrontal cortex. Look at Psalm 1. It's titled, The Way of the Righteous Opposed to the Wicked or the Blessed Man. And it says this, <laughs> Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, doesn't stand in the way of sinners, uh, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers. But his delight, get this, build your gray matter, repair it, reframe it when you're angry or some other deep emotion that is going to be detrimental if you respond by your natural tendencies, or I do. It says this, but the delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He thinks about it all day long. Uh, he thinks about it in the night when he awakes and when he goes to sleep. Listen, how well do you meditate upon God's Word when you're going off to sleep at night when you're so angry about what somebody did or what, what happened or the fight you had or, oh, they're so stupid, don't they understand? Because after all, we're always right. Psalm 19, 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. 
my attitude, that my preferences, my biases, my way of looking at things, let them be acceptable to you. For Lord, you're my rock, you're my redeemer. See, that's what meditation does. It reframes our thinking so that when something happens and our emotions rise high, we don't check out. There is a stability here because we have grown and repaired our gray matter, our mind. It says, be like-minded. Have the mind of Christ. The, the Scriptures go on. You, you, you know some of these that I'm talking. You're probably thinking of Scriptures that go along with this. <clears throat> We're going to look at James 1 here. Verse 20. Actually, I'll start with verse 19 because it's just really good. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Ooh, we got to fight against what's going on. We have to put reins on it. We have to harness it. We have a responsibility. For anger, verse 20, get it, you've heard it, you know it. For the anger of man does not produce the rightness or righteousness of God. Anger, unbridled, just letting it fly, does not bring about the righteousness of God. He can use anger within the design and it produces good and it shows the righteousness of God. But if you and I take anger outside of the design of what's happening and we do not know the law of God, we do not meditate on the law of God, we do not apply His word and virtue and character into the fabric of who we are becoming, Paul writes it, be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. This is not believing in Jesus and thinking like we used to think before we knew him. This is coming to faith in him and now reframing our thinking, renewing our thinking, changing the process. And now what comes out of our mouth and what comes out in our conduct or what doesn't come out of our mouth because it shouldn't. I want to attach this anger that sometimes we can feel to unforgiveness. Each person's sin, it indicts the whole body. We're a family, we're a community. Um, it's amazing, think about this, it is amazing that God has, a, amazing that God has deemed us worthy to do such a righteous act as forgiveness. Understand, you and I have been called to forgive. It's not a philosophy, it's a reality. It's what is. You and I have been called to forgive. So it doesn't mean that everything that makes you angry, but when it has to do with someone else or a group of people, whatever it is, and there is, there is this anger and this leads to this unforgiveness, you're destroying your physical body, you're hurting your testimony. You're hurting the people around you. It's, a, it's just it's affecting your whole life. 
That's what anger will do, the pattern of anger. And if the anger has attached to a person or group of people, then you and I have this call to be forgiving. You know, we can, here's, this, here's the beautiful thing about what can happen in the, in the church, is that forgiveness can happen without words, and it does. Let, let me explain it to you this way. Um, so, somebody in the body, we'll, we'll use the example of somebody in the church body, offended you, hurt you, whatever it is. It wasn't necessarily some big knockdown, drag out thing, any of that. But you are the one who has this, I got to work through the forgiveness thing, and I'm really kind of angry about this. And how could they do that? And how could they act like, you know, and all this because they're wrong, they're wrong, they're wrong, and they did this. Is that you go to a private place of prayer, and you meditate on his word, and you pray for them, and you forgive them. You never had the conversation. In fact, they may not even know that they offended you or hurt you like you took it. So the forgiveness is going on without even a word of conversation to each other. That's, that's, what's, that's what should be happening within the body. Yes, do you need to come together and talk on certain things and work things out and forgive one another and, and do all of that? And Yes, I, Jesus talks about it. The Bible talks about it. But much of the forgiveness is done without a word. What happens when, I don't know, we'll use the spouse. Say maybe your spouse hurt you, said something. You, you were in the house, and they were out in the yard, and they're getting ready to leave, and something was said, and it wasn't a big argument, but this is the way they said it did it, and you kind of went, ouch, and they got in the vehicle, and they left. They didn't leave mad. They didn't even know they hurt you, but you're left there going, ouch. And what do you do with that? After all I do for her or do for him and blah, 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 and this is how they say, how they treat me. Boy, when they get back, are they going to hear about... Or is it, and it may involve a conversation later. I'm not saying negate that. I'm just saying forgiveness can happen in a marriage and in a family and in a home and in the body and even with a stranger that you can be so angry at, you're never going to probably see him again and yet you're offended and hurt. You know, you're left with, how do we do that? We know his word, we meditate on it, we talk to him about it, and we release this unforgiveness. And we don't operate under anger. It was forgiveness without a word to the individual. Now here's the interesting thing that you have to realize. That while you're doing that, there's a chance that somebody else in the body is doing the very same thing over something you did that you don't even know about. Or maybe you thought you hurt them, but you forgot about it. You see, that's what's supposed to be going on in the community of believers. Anger is not to lead us to sin and to harbor unforgiveness. Because remember where we started. Ephesians 4, I had you say, sunset forgiveness. Try it again. Sunset forgiveness. Worship team, you can come. Ephesians 4, verse 26. Listen to this. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger... It's not the end of the sentence. Now listen to the rest of the sentence. If we don't have sunset forgiveness, if we don't stop sinning in our anger, listen to this. Have sunset forgiveness. Don't let the sun go down in your anger so that you give no opportunity to the devil. If we don't operate in our anger without sinning, and if we sin in our anger and we harbor unforgiveness, we don't resolve it, at the end of the day, 
You will give room for the devil to be at work. He now has something to hold on to and something to work with in your life. In the monastery, and this is probably former monastery, I don't know about recent days, but in the history of monastery, what would happen is the lead person, the abbot, okay, the abbot would come at the evening worship every day, evening worship. The abbot would come, at some point in that service, he would stand up and he would look at his brothers and he would ask them to forgive him for his wrongdoings, the sins he committed, also the sins, the things that he should have done, but he didn't do. He asks for their forgiveness. He confesses. He asks for forgiveness in the evening worship before the sun sets. And in turn, what would happen is then the brothers would say to the abbot the same thing. Would you forgive me? Please assure me of forgiveness for what I've done, what I didn't do that I should have. And they go through this every evening in the evening worship to assure forgiveness and peace and brotherhood would stand to give no opportunity for the devil to work somebody over. You see, every anger, offense, and division, this is every anger, offense, and division must be settled by sunset. Have you ever watched a movie before you went to bed? And then you go to bed, and not always, but all of a sudden, as you are going to sleep, and then if you remember your dreams, if you remember a dream, or you wake up and you go, oh my goodness, I, I was just Batman. I, I, was, I was Luke Skywalker. Only I was like, got my lightsaber out and I was I wasn't in the galaxy I was on earth and I was downtown and ran to these people and I pulled out my lights you know none of it's reality it's all you know and this is what was on your mind less you know you kind of going on or did you ever have a phone call for someone you've been talk to a long while and then you start to talk and you have a good time and you hang up and it's like, hey, so-and-so called me. It was great. I haven't talked to them for so long and whatever else. I mean, I will ju I'll just confess this to you, okay? This, this, it's just, you know how dreams are. They don't make sense. Unless it's from the Lord, they just don't make sense. I had an email come from a friend of mine that I haven't talked to really in years for the most part. I think we've seen each other only a handful of times since I moved from that town in 1988. Okay? And yes, I was an adult then. <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> Some of you are like, 88? I wasn't even born yet. Wait, you'll get there, God, Terry. So, it was just a nice, really nice email. I mean, it was like, Wow. You know, just the impact I've had on his life, the friendship we've had. I replied back. It was just really nice. This was a guy I knew when I was in my first place of full-time ministry. <sighs> so it was just on my mind. And you go off to sleep. And then I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm like, what in the world? Where did that come from? Him and I, in this dream... We, <laughs> this the setting is crazy. I mean, him and I'll just tell you, okay, because him and I were never in a place like this. But whatever, it was on my mind. He was on my mind, and in my dream, we got in a bar fight together against four younger guys. 
And I, was, I woke up, I was like, what in the world? Why in the... It's just that I was thinking about him, and you know how that works? Have you ever had something disturbing on your mind that was motivated by anger and you, you have a hard time going to sleep or you go to sleep and you're angry and you wake up angry and you have an angry dream if you remember it? And you just... See what happens? It's been active. Only when it comes to anger and real life stuff the next morning and the issues, it fights against it fights against his mercies are new every morning. There's this contest because we didn't solve something. That we didn't, and listen, to forgive somebody, they don't have to say, I'm sorry. They don't have to say anything to you. You and I have the power to forgiveness. The prerequisite is not that they say, I'm sorry. Some of, you, some of us, we, we feel like, oh, I've resolved my anger from years ago on what was done to me. If that's so, how come you still live under the influence as a result of that, what happened? You're still guarded because the person did this. So your relationships are guarded because the person... Or you get overly aggressive when you feel like somebody might, you know, be taking advantage of you because I was taking advantage of you. I'm never going to let that happen again. And here you are, you worship, Christian, we pray, we read the word. But we still have the influence of whatever happened showing up in our life. I don't know if it's still anger, if it's unforgiveness, or if it's opening yourself up to the Lord that you would trust Him, that you would be free.